Welcome listeners. You are listening to a podcast from the Free People's Movement, out of Sweden. Episode 13. The Lord of the Rings and the All-Seeing Eye. If you are listening to the audio-only version of this podcast, make sure you follow us on YouTube and Rumble, as this episode contains some supporting graphics. Like we've said before, the deep state is a very old entity, but has taken a few different forms over the years. What was once called colonialism, now exists in the form of globalism. Remember. Controlling money buys control of government. Control of information, money and government buys control of the people. Seeing as the entity we call the deep state, have been around for such a long time, there surely must have been people over the years, who knew about this hidden structure, and have tried to counteract it? Yes. But if they were too vocal about it, more often than not, they would either end up silenced, or murdered. Actually, there is no shortage of people that have tried to counteract the deep state over the years, but let's just say they were not always successful. At least not until now. We will in this episode have a look at a certain individual, that without question, knew a lot about the deep state and did his best to expose what he could manage. John Ronald Royal Tolkien, born 3 January 1892 in Bloemfontein, in present-day South Africa and died 2 September 1973 in Bournemouth, Dorset, United Kingdom. He was a British author, philologist and university professor and best known as the author of the fantasy novels The Lord of the Rings. Already as a child he showed a fantastic language ability and as a young student he was fascinated by the Kalevala epic. Kalevala is a Finnish and Karelian national epic. It is a heroic poem in 50 songs, which is characterized by alliterations and a special rhythm. Based on that, he created all the fairy tales, languages and worlds that today can be seen as one of the cornerstones of the fantasy genre. Tolkien, who was a professor of Anglo-Saxon in Oxford, was also fluent in Nordic languages and could read, among other things, Swedish. It is also the Nordic languages that form the basis of his own language which he incorporated into the Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was also friends with another master, C.S. Lewis, whose books on Narnia have captivated generations of children. Tolkien studied English and English literature at the University of Oxford, majoring in philology. He was a signal officer in the British Army during the First World War, and took part in the Battle of the Somme. He contracted trench fever in late 1916 and spent the rest of the war in England. Meanwhile on the home front, he began work on his legend, which would not appear in print until four years after his death, in the book Silmarillion, in 1977. Seeing as he had served as a signal officer in the First World War, by the time the Second World War came around, Tolkien was earmarked as a code-breaker. In January 1939, he was hand-picked to serve in the cryptographic department of the Foreign Office, in the event of national emergency. Before the outbreak of the Second World War, the Government Code and Cipher School, which became known as GCHQ in April 1946, ran courses for handpicked individuals from universities who might join the organization in the event of war. As seen on this list from the GCHQ, Tolkien would take part in the Scandinavian and Spanish areas of study. He is even written down as keen, meaning he was eager to take part in the studies. By late October 1939, Tolkien was informed that his services would no longer be required. In short, they didn't want him anywhere near signal intelligence. We could speculate quite extensively about the reason the GCHQ decided to end Tolkien's engagement as a codebreaker, but as we will try to show in this episode, it was probably because he was a bit too clever for his own good. What if we told you that Tolkien probably had his suspicions, that something didn't quite add up? Remember, he had served in the First World War as a signal officer, but now the GCHQ didn't want his services. We are willing to bet, that Tolkien might have been a little too open about his suspicions. It's very hard to find anything today, that relates to Tolkien's dismissal from the GCHQ. The official statement from the GCHQ completely contradicts what Tolkien himself has written. 
The statement reads as follows. Although he has keen written after his name, possibly indicating he was willing to undertake such work, in the end, he did not join us. Alternatively, Keen could simply be a note on how to pronounce Tolkien. We'll probably never know which meaning was intended. Well, either Tolkien was considered a liability, due to his insights about the world, or he simply decided not to take part in the charade. It doesn't really matter, as both alternatives are probable. So, how can we be sure that Tolkien actually, so to speak, knew too much? Let's just say that he tells us, through the Lord of the Rings novels. Tolkien actually exposes several parts of what we call the deep state, although shrouded in metaphors and similes. The name the Lord of the Rings is actually a play on words, pointing to the governor of the Bank of England, a man called Montague Collett Norman. A collet is a subtype of chuck that forms a collar around an object, to be held, and exerts a strong clamping force on the object, when it is tightened. In short, a ring that exerts pressure around one's neck. The rings, in the novel, symbolizes the central banks in each country, exerting pressure around the neck of the population, through debt. The Bank of England is the central bank of the United Kingdom. The Lord of the Rings metaphorically describes the banking system with the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, with the national central banks as intermediaries, and the regional banks, as the ultimate executive unit against the population. Rings within rings, within a ring. This is the system of rings that colonial empire creators, such as Cecil Rhodes, called round-table conferences, and as described by Professor Carol Quigley in the book Tragedy and Hope, we know these rings within the BIS and the IMF, as the Bilderberg Group. G20 The Trilateral Commission and the Foreign Policy Institutes this is masterfully thought out by Tolkien, who in addition to writing fairy tales and being a professor of Old Norse languages at Oxford, was also a committed debater on the financial systems and their contemporary course and origins. So, we've established that the rings symbolize the banks. Well what about Sauron's all-seeing eye, that sits on top of Mount Inbaradjir? Well, who surveils everything? Who sees all? This is of course, also a metaphor. Let us introduce the telephone tower, in Stockholm. The telephone tower was completed in 1887 and was a 50-meter high truss tower, on Mount Skilnadsgaten, that collected 4,000 telephone wires in Stockholm. In the building below, switchboard operators sat and connected the calls. Of course, it would never occur to them, to have wiretapping activities in the same building. The telephone tower had been commissioned by Stockholm's Public Telephone AB, a company that would later merge with Ericsson. Go back and listen to episode 2, where we explain more about the company called Ericsson. Pretty soon, the public and the press thought that the tower was ugly and that a decoration was needed. A prize competition was then announced for the decoration of the tower. The competition was won by Jay Zetterstedt who was an official at the company. The proposal was substantially reworked by the architect Fritz Eckert, around 1890, and the tower got the four corner towers, with pennant poles. At all major events in the city, it was decorated with flags. There were also smaller telephone towers at the company's substations on Svartmangatan 6 and Hornsgate and 9. As early as the beginning of the 1890s, the wires began to be joined together in underground cables. Around 1913, the rebuilding was completed, and the telephone tower lost its function, even though individual wires remained. Having the cables hanging in the sky above Stockholm was blocking the sun for the inhabitants. Did the sun ever shine in Mordor? In 1939, a rotating clock was mounted on the tower, the so-called NK clock. The dial has a diameter of 7.6 meters and was then Europe's largest. The NK clock was manufactured in 1939 by the company ASEA. ASEA, just like Ericsson is also controlled by the Wallenberg family, through their investment company Investor. <laughs> 
I'm sure you remember the swastika in the old ASEA logotype. The entire clock weighs 7 tons, and the NK clock became a popular feature in the cityscape. If you look at the telephone tower with its rotating clock at the top, what sort of parallels can you draw? Needless to say, Tolkien's metaphor for the all-seeing eye of Sauron was the NK clock. All-seeing, as it symbolizes the surveillance that Ericsson conducts through the telecommunications infrastructure. Remember, the deep state control both money and information, and Tolkien had a very good idea as to how. After Tolkien got into a dispute with his publisher, George Allen and Unwin, who didn't want to publish his novel, he had to turn to publisher William Collins in 1950. Tolkien intended The Silmarillion, itself largely unrevised at this point, to be published along with The Lord of the Rings, but Allen and Unwin were unwilling to do this. Milton Waldman, his contact at Collins, expressed the belief that The Lord of the Rings itself urgently needed cutting. After several back and forths with the publishers, Tolkien eventually got frustrated and demanded that they publish the book, in 1952. Collins refused. On Wednesday, July 23, 1952, a fire broke out in Televerkit's radio laboratory, which was housed underneath the telephone tower, causing severe damage to the tower and the rest of the building. The very next day it was decided that the tower would have to be demolished. Tolkien again wrote to Alan and Unwin, saying, I would gladly consider the publication of any part of the books, fearing his work would never see the light of day. One might think that somebody with influence didn't want the books published, or at least, to delay the publication. In 1953, the telephone tower was finally demolished, officially citing the reason being that the risk of it collapsing was too great. So the tower had stood for almost a year after the fire, but the risk of collapse was still too great for it to stay in place. The NK clock was dismantled shortly before the telephone tower was demolished, but reassembled within a year at its current location, on the department store NK's roof. There had been plans to turn the telephone tower into a skyscraper, but because of the fire, this never happened. Delays in producing appendices, maps and indexes, led to The Lord of the Rings being published later than originally planned. The first book was published on the 29th of July 1954, the second on the 11th of November 1954 and the third on the 20th of October 1955, in the United Kingdom. When the books got out to the public, the telephone tower was gone. There are many many more metaphors in the books, but we've chosen this one because it is central to the story. Another metaphor is that of a certain Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil is the name of a character in Tolkien's Legendarium, and he is also featured in The Lord of the Rings. Although Bombadil was omitted from Peter Jackson's film trilogy, the 1978 film and radio adaptations of The Lord of the Rings, as considered non-essential to the story, when he is in fact, anything but. Due to Tom Bombadil's different nature, many of Tolkien's readers have speculated about him. Various attempts have been made to explain who he really is, and to make him fit into Tolkien's mythology. Tolkien, however, deliberately left Tom Bombadil a mystery. Tolkien was well versed in the Swedish language and culture and probably even the mentality of the Swedish people. In The Lord of the Rings, when Frodo stays at Tom Bombadil's house, he asked the question to his wife. Who is Tom, really? She replies, he is the master, of wood, water and hill. That didn't really mean anything to Frodo, and what could that possibly mean? So maybe it's another metaphor. What is made using these three components? Wood, water and hills. At least since the 12th century, hydropower has been used in Sweden, to take advantage of forests and ores. Around the year 1200, the first hydropower plants in the Nordic countries were built. For almost 700 years, hydropower has been used in the Nordic countries, and has long been owned and controlled by the monarchy. The crown had ownership of all major watercourses, along with associated hydropower. By using more modern hydro plants, Sweden was later the first country in Europe to receive electricity. Harnesand was one of the first cities in Europe to have street lighting in 1885. 
Thanks to hydropower, Sweden also was the first country in the world to have electric trains. If any country would be considered the master of wood, water and hill. It's Sweden. Tom Bombadil is described as a happy person wearing a blue coat, yellow boots and a feather in his hat. As he is somewhat of a pacifist and seemingly benevolent, he took no open stance against the Dark Lord. He is also carefree and oblivious to the troubles of the world, and is unaffected by the power of the ring. Remember, Sweden remained unaffected during both world wars, and has in general, probably the world's most mentally formatted population. And we do find it a bit strange, that the connection between Tom Bombadil and Sweden, hasn't been made earlier, seeing as the colours of his outfit should give the metaphor away, almost instantly. It's our opinion that Tolkien was both pointing a finger at Sweden as a country, as well as being a satire of the Swedish people's mentality. The last example of a metaphor we will touch on is the fact that Frodo was taking the One Ring to Mordor, as it had to be destroyed in the same fire that it had been forged in. Seeing as the rings symbolize the central banks, it could be argued that the idea of central banking had to be destroyed at its place of origin. Do you remember where the world's first central bank was established? Sweden. In 1668. Most metaphors in The Lord of the Rings fell on deaf ears, but by this time, it's quite easy to see where the geopolitical events of today is going to lead eventually. History is being unraveled in reverse, and the core of the deep state is in Sweden. Maybe it's only a coincidence that the people counteracting the deep state uses a lot of Lord of the Rings references. If you look for it, you will find it. Thank you for listening.